Hello, everyone. This is Trevor May, VRF Induct Free Split Technical Specialist with Standard Air and Light, back with another tech tip. So this tech tip is going to be focused on our Vroom selection software, which is a service tool for the ductless and the VRF product in terms of building a system out being able to generate reports, and then also being a tool for us, not only as service technicians, but for the sales team to make sure that they are properly applying a system and to make sure that the piping links and the equipment selections are a valid selection to make sure that they will work with each other. So let's go ahead and just dive right into it. So first and foremost, when you go ahead and click on the Vroom app, the Vroom app in and of itself is going to look like a little high wall unit icon that is blowing out air. It's a blue icon itself with a high wall head and uh, a depiction of supplier coming out of that high wall head itself. So when you go ahead and click on the app, I'll tell you what, I'm just gonna go ahead and exit out of this. So when you go ahead and click on the Vroom app, you should have a selection that you come up between a carrier system and a Toshiba carrier system. So depending on what VRF system you're trying to lay out, whether it's a carrier VRF system or a Toshiba carrier VRF system, this should be your basis depending on what you need to choose. And of course, you need to make sure that you choose appropriately. Now, if you're building a ductless system, the ductless will work in either one of these carrier or Toshiba carrier options. This just differentiates between the two different style VRF systems that we uh, sell here at Standard Air. So in this case, we're just going to go ahead and choose the Toshiba option on this and then go ahead and click OK. What you're going to see on here is if you were working on a previous file, there is an auto save feature where it'll bring up the most recent file that you've been working on. And if that's applicable to the situation that you're dealing with, just go ahead and click yes. If not, and you want to start a new job, go ahead and click no on this option. Once you've done so, you'll see now that your blank screen is up here and you're actually in the Vroom selection software. So what we need to address first is understanding the tabs that we have available with the Vroom selection software. So first is going to be your file tab. Now, if you click on the file tab, this is where you can get information about the version and the current project and the last saved project in the file. You can come here and start a new job. You can open an existing job or you can exit out of here. Typically, what I tell you is instead of clicking on this, your home tab on here, which is your next tab to the right of the file, is going to essentially allow you the same options to either start a new job or open a job. Now, you have your units tab. Now, when you start a job on here, this is where your indoor units are going to be. And this is also where your Y joints and your header joints for a VRF system are going to be located at. So you can drag them from the units tab and then put them in the system depending on how you want to split that up. The next tab to the right of that is going to be your tools tab. The tools tab on there, you can see you have a system check button to ensure that everything checks out to make sure you're not getting any error messages. Of course, if you get an error message, you need to make sure that you correct those issues. If you look to the right of the system check, you'll see the export Excel project summary. This is going to be the tab where you can export all of the jobs information in an Excel format. So when you do so, as an example, we'll just go ahead and pull one up right now. So what you're going to get is an Excel file that pulls up with a cover page that looks something almost exactly like this. The only difference being that, of course, the project name is going to be whatever project that you're working on. You click on the next tab within the Excel file, you'll get an equipment list and master price list export out of room. And of course, the diameter of pipe that's on the job, the total length that you're going to be using, and then any bends associated with it. And again, that a bend is considered a 45 degree or a 90 degree fitting on that refrigeration pipe itself. Your next tab on there is going to be your piping layout for outdoor unit one in this case. Now, if you have multiple systems, you're going to have multiple tabs with piping. But in this case, we're just dealing with one outdoor unit. So this is going to be the piping diagram with the outdoor unit. You'll notice on here, you're going to get your connected capacity, which you see in the percentage right there. You're going to get the model number of the outdoor unit you're working with and also the active D rate for the cooling and the heating modes, depending on what design conditions that you entered in the beginning of the software when you're putting the job together. You'll also see on here that you get your piping diameter, the length and the amount of bends that are involved with that refrigeration pipe. 
you're going to get your splitter joint or what we call a Y joint on there with its associated part number. And then you're also going to get the indoor unit information, the D rates on the indoor unit, both in the heating and the cooling mode, and also what you're calling the indoor unit. Now, in this case, I just did something generic, indoor unit one, two, three, four, et cetera, down the line. The tab to the right of the piping is going to be your wiring tab, which gives you the gauge of the control wire, the name of the control bus, and where it actually goes in, in reference to how the system is going to be wired. So we can see the U1 and U2 bus is from our outdoor unit to our first indoor unit, and then continuing that daisy chain across the entire string of indoor units until we reach our last indoor unit and we terminate. And right next to the U1 and U2 is going to be the actual wire size that is appropriate for this system. And same thing goes from the indoor unit to the wired wall controller on top of giving you the part number of the wired controller and the gauge of wire that's going to make sense and more importantly work for the application. And then also the name of the control bus, which is the AB control bus from indoor unit to wired controller. The next tab to your right is your outdoor unit information. So this is going to be your system tag name, any tag references that you put in on the system, the make of the equipment. So in this case, we're dealing with a Toshiba carrier. So our make comes up as the Toshiba model. The model number of that associated outdoor unit, your nominal cooling and heating capacity, the weight of the outdoor unit, the design conditions for cooling outdoor temperature, the design conditions for your heating outdoor temperature wet bulb, you're going to get your corrected capacities both for cooling and for heating based on those two temperatures that we just discussed right here. The voltage of your system, your MCA and your MOCP, which is going to be for wire sizing and breaker sizing. To the right of the outdoor unit tab is going to be the same exact information except now for your indoor units, the make, the model, the style or the type of indoor unit, nominal capacities, diameter of piping, design conditions for both heating and cooling, the corrected capacities both from a total cooling capacity and a sensible cooling capacity, and of course our heating capacity, all of which again are the corrected or derated capacities. Your voltage information, your MCAs and MOCPs for wire and breaker sizing, the selected fan speed with its appropriate output in terms of CFM, static pressure if it's applicable, and then also the associated zone or local controller. In this case, we just have all hardwired wall mounted remote controllers. Okay, but as a generalized overview, this is what this Excel sheet is going to export out of room for you. And typically this is what I send to our sales staff when we are building jobs out so that they have this information to forward along to you. And these two sheets right here are essentially going to be the guide throughout the installation to let you know how the system is going to be installed to make sure you have the correct material and essentially just act as another uh, form or material that you can check to make sure that the job is going to go as smoothly as possible during its installation phase. Okay, so let's go ahead and get out of this and go back to the Vroom software. So the next option to the Excel project summary is going to be your diagram for PDFs. So you can export those piping and wiring diagrams that we just looked at in a PDF format if you don't want to do it in an Excel format. The tab to the right of that is going to be export to quote pro. This is strictly for us as a distributor. This is the option that the salesmen take these room files that I send them and bring them into our quoting software, which is called quote pro. And that's as deep as we'll dive into that. That's just something that you guys as an installing contractor don't need to concern yourself with. If you are working with AutoCAD files, you do have an option to export this room file over into a AutoCAD friendly format so that you can take and import different pictures of the indoor units and then any associated information into an AutoCAD file. To the right of the AutoCAD is going to be the equipment documents. So this is material such as spec sheets and then more importantly, submittals. So submittals for the outdoor unit, indoor unit, and any form of controllers that you may have on that job. To the right of the equipment documents is the Revit families file. This one you do not have to worry about. You're not going to use this. I rarely use this myself, so I'm just going to tell you to ignore it for the time being. There shouldn't really be a circumstance where this becomes applicable for you to try to use. 
And then finally to that, you can export all documents. So this includes everything that we've just covered on there. And then you can pick and choose which files you would like to export out of the software. If you look to the right of the all documents and you skip over one little icon, you'll see there is a switch view tab up there, which is your central controller and your wiring diagram. Now, depending on if you have a system with a centralized controller, this is the icon that you're gonna to wanna to click on to look at the central controller and add a system. And we'll cover that here as we start building the system out. And then to the right of that is gonna be your wiring diagram. That's essentially how you have a view of what we looked at in the Excel document with a wiring diagram, looking at it in the Vroom software before it's exported. Okay, so if we go back up to our tabs on here, we've covered the home, our units, now our tools. The last one we need to go over here is just the display. And the real only thing that I'll tell you on this is you can have set different layouts on here, but to be honest with you, I really don't suspect that you're gonna spend much time playing around in here unless you wanna customize your specific room software to a color that you like or a configuration that you like. Uh, but I really don't foresee you guys spending much time in here. So staying focused, the home, units, and the tools tabs are gonna be the most popular tabs that you're gonna access on a routine basis as you go out and build these jobs and start putting VRF and ductless systems together. Okay, so let's go back to our start, which is our home. Now, again, if you have a previously saved job and you're using this for the second, third, or fourth time, this is how you can open up a job that you've already built and saved to your desktop. But in this case, we're going to start new, so we're going to go ahead and click on the new tab. Now, you'll see you'll get this project default up here. This is where you can enter all of your technical information such as in this case, your name, the person who's working on the project. So we'll just put my name in there. We'll call this test one and project one. And you can put addresses in here, but they are not required. If you look very carefully, your project date, your name, and your project name all have these little asterisks on there, which means they're required. So those three are going to be the only ones that are required. You don't have to enter in a project number, nor do you have to enter in a project address. I'm just doing so for the sake of this class. Okay, so once you've got that in, go ahead over into your next tab, which is the project details. Now you guys as installing contractors typically aren't gonna be dealing with any engineering firms, but if you are, this is where the information for the engineering firm that you're working with would go. If not, I always just put an NA in there, an a, NA in there, and you'll notice there's two asterisks on here, which means that's required information, and then your information. Now, in this case, I just put a generic name on there, and of course, as well, a generic address, name, email, and then of course, you can put a phone number in there as well. Now, you'll notice on here, there's one more asterisk aside from the name and the addresses. This is the project phase. Typically, as a distributor, we either put a plan and spec job where the job is designed by an engineering firm, and they have a specified manufacturer, whether that be us or Mitsubishi, and then multiple contractors go after and place bids on the project. Or we deal with the design build jobs where we as a distributor work directly with you to help you lay out a VRF system. Now for you guys, you can pretty much put whatever terminology makes sense, whether you wanna do project phase and you just wanna call it a quote. You can certainly do that or you can pretty much call it whatever you'd like and then you're building project type. This isn't required to choose, but it'll give you a list of different applications, both from a residential and a commercial standpoint. So in this case, we'll just say we're dealing with healthcare. Okay, scrolling over to your next tab, which is your design conditions. This is gonna be the most important tab out of all four of these tabs on here. This is where you're gonna go in and set those design conditions, what we talked about in the Excel report, where we had our outdoor unit design temperature, indoor unit and outdoor unit wet bulbs, so this is where we can adjust all that information. So if you scroll down to the Pennsylvania tab and then pick the Pittsburgh area, this will give you a preset design condition. Now these are typical design conditions for this area. Uh, generally, people were specking the outdoor dry ball for cooling at 89. More recently, we've seen that um, with, I would say all, but most engineers are now specking that around a 95 degree outdoor ambient. So that's totally up to you guys on what you design it for. If you want my opinion on it, I always put 95 in there just because that's what we're seeing more and more um, as time goes on as far as outdoor temperature design conditions. Now in here, this is where you can pick the temperature that you want the system to maintain 
in the application that you're looking for. So let's just say we're looking to maintain 72 degrees at 53% relative humidity. Now you'll notice on there, it automatically calculates our wet bulb for that space. Or if you know your dry bulb and your wet bulb, it'll automatically calculate your indoor relative humidity. Now, if you look over to the right for our heating section, this is where you're gonna set your parameters for maintaining the first one, which is gonna be your indoor temperature or the, the temperature the system needs to heat to. So designed for 70, which is typical design. And then your outdoor conditions for what that outdoor unit's going to experience. And then also take into consideration for D rating. So if you don't want it at one degrees and you wanna design it around 25 degrees, and you want to design it roughly about 72% outdoor relative humidity during the winter, you'll automatically calculate your wet bulb and vice versa. If you know your wet bulb, it'll automatically calculate your relative humidity. Okay, so in this case, we're just going to go to the default on it. Okay, so we've got our design conditions entered on there. Everything's good for cooling. Everything's good for heating. The last tab that we have is our defaults, and this is where you can set if you want programmable wired controllers to automatically populate for a zone local controller with an indoor unit, or you can select a 24 volt interface as the default. Typically, I just leave it at the programmable wired controller. Okay, auto select indoor units, you can base it off of total cooling, sensible cooling, or a specific heating capacity that you're looking for. So that's always a nice feature on there. And then of course you can change how the units are labeled. By default, you'll see outdoor unit, indoor unit, and then you can always go in and change that. You can change your default refrigerant line set length. In this case, the basis is 10 feet, and then the default outdoor refrigerant line length, which is three feet. Now you'll notice on here, there's a capacity override password. This is something that the factory deals with directly and the developers of this room software have. I do not have the password for that. That is something that we take on a case-by-case -case basis because we're over a certain connected capacity and it must have factory approval to do so. So this is really something that you shouldn't concern yourself with unless we run into a very unique circumstance. So now that we've covered everything in our project default tabs, we're gonna go ahead and hit the OK button. And next, we're gonna get a prompt on here to choose what kind of system that we're working with. So in this case, we're dealing with a Toshiba carrier output, and we have our heat recovery, we have our heat pump, both of which are three phase, we have our single phase product line, which is going to be the single phase VRF, three, four, and five ton heat pump systems. If you're looking for a single phase heat recovery, that's going to be in the heat recovery tab. That is both three phase and single phase. The heat pump selection is all three phase. You have single zone residential for our high tier, which is going to be the 40 MPH high wall style unit. The single zone residential, that's going to be your 40 MAQ high wall unit, and of course, all the other units that are associated with it. And then our entry to your model, which is going to be the 40 MHH if you're using a high wall unit, and of course, any other outdoor units associated. We have our single zone RAV, which is the Toshiba carrier product uh, line on there. To be honest with you, uh, we don't stock really much of any Toshiba carrier ductless equipment anymore. So I really don't perceive you using that, um, but it is an option on there. And then our last one, and probably the most popular one, is going to be the multi-zone ductless. So if you're going in here and building a ductless system, let's just say, so we're building a multi-zone ductless, go ahead and click OK. You'll see now your next prompt is going to be to choose the size of your outdoor unit. So let's just say we're working with a three-ton multi-zone system. So you've got that three-ton multi-zone system. Just go ahead and hit OK. All of this stuff on the left we could ignore for the time being. To us at this point in time, it's not relevant. So once you hit OK, there's your system up there. You'll see your system name. You'll see the outdoor unit with its model number, followed by the connectable zones that we have to work with. Now, if you go over to your system list and you right click on that, you'll notice you get a little sub menu that comes up when you right click. You can either add a new system on here if you want to have multiple systems, or if you're building a system and you want to duplicate that system, that's the tab you want to do that. Or if you have multiple systems on here and you want to remove one, this is how you would remove the system. But for the terms of what I'm trying to show you, you right click this and this is how you get into rename. So you right click on this, hover over the rename, left click, it'll highlight it. Just go ahead and hit your delete or your backspace button. And then you can name this however you'd like. So I'm just going to name this generically DLS1. 
left click. Now we've changed the name of the system. Now we can proceed on. So what we're going to do is we're going to go up to our units tab up top here and go ahead and click on that. And you'll see we have our cassette, our ducted, our high wall type, our under ceiling floor console, which is the dual purpose unit, and then our true vertical air handling unit. So let's just say we want to take a high wall in here. We want to left click this and then drag it over to our first space and let go. Now you'll see you have a window that comes up on here and now you can make your selections for the tonnage of indoor unit you want connected. So let's just say we want a 12,000 BTU high wall. We're going to go ahead and select it. You can choose your piping length, number of bends, and vertical height of the unit and that's in reference to where the outdoor unit is located whether that is on located on the ground or if it's located on the roof if the outdoor unit was located on the ground and the unit was above the outdoor unit let's just say on the first floor that would be a positive 10 feet now if you had the same scenario except the outdoor unit is above the indoor unit that would be negative 10 feet and so on and so forth, depending on the application. And again, that's in reference to vertical height. Now, in this case, you can name the room. So we'll just call this, oops, just call this our test room. And then we'll just label it generically. And you can put whatever you'd like in here, whatever makes sense for you. I'm just going to call this indoor unit one. Now, from there, before you hit OK, there's two other tabs you need to make sure that you go through. Look over here, you have your model info, which we're in right now. But if you click the controls tab. This is where you can set up specific groups. And multi zones typically you're not going to get into the group configuration on there, but more importantly with the wired controller. So you can see on here you have a programmable wired remote controller and then its part number that's associated with this particular indoor unit. If you left click on this, you can choose to have nothing, an interface, or a wired controller that is non-programmable. Now in this case, I just leave it with a programmable wired controller. Or with the high wall units, if you don't want anything, you can click none, hit OK, and then there's your unit. Label test room, indoor unit one, a 40 MAQD 12,000 unit. Okay, now let's just say you're building a system like this now and you've got your unit here and you go, man, I have to drag and drop everything all the time. Well, you don't. If you're dealing with another unit, let's just say you have two more of these 12,000 units on this system and you go, I don't want to have to drag and drop every time. Well, you don't have to. If you hover over this unit that you just added and you right click it, you can copy this unit, right click on that empty space, left click to paste, and there's your other 12. Same thing for your last unit. There you go, you've got your three 12s. Now what you can do is you'll notice when you copy them, it copies the room name. So these are all test rooms but it does not copy the indoor unit number. So you need to double click on this. Go ahead and change this to indoor unit two, indoor unit three, and so on and so forth to make it make sense and actually match the application. Now you have all of your outdoor units on there. Okay, now that's if you had all the same equal tonnage. So in this case, we needed 312s, so we could copy and paste. Let's look at it from a different scenario. Let's say we have a 12,000 unit and two nines. What you can still do instead of dragging and dropping, you can right click, copy, and paste. Now what you do is double click on it and it opens it back up. Select 9,000 BTUs. Go ahead and name this number two and click okay. And there you go. Both of them are test room, indoor unit one, indoor unit two. You've got a 12 and a nine. And since in this example, we're going to need another nine, we can right click it, copy, right click, paste. And then all we have to do, remember, is add in that indoor unit number, in this case, three. Now we've got what we needed for this system. Everything makes sense. This is checking out. What you want to do is you want to go to your home tab and hover over the system check. This is just to make sure that there's no issues with your layout so far. So go ahead and left click that. You'll notice on there, because we don't have a cap or an ending tube at the end of this last zone that's not used, all pipe runs must end with either indoor units, which we have here, or end caps, which means it needs to be capped off. Okay, so what you're going to do is, is you're going to go to your units tab, 
and hover over this little copper end cap and you can left click, drag and drop to do that. Or you can go over this and you don't even have to go to this menu at all to units tab. You can right click this and hit paste. Oh, excuse me, I must have changed something here. Oh, there we are. That's what I'm looking for. So what you can do over here is if you go back to the units tab and you hit add end caps, that'll automatically populate any unused zones with an end cap. And then again, come over to your home tab, hover over the system check. All checks successfully performed. We're good to go. Now you build a system out. You can see your D rates for cooling, your D rates for heating. If for some odd reason that you need to go back and change and you say, you know what, I want to change my design condition for my outdoor temperature for heating. You can go to your home tab and then within the home tab menu, go to project defaults, left click, and it brings up that window that we've seen at the beginning of the screen. So you click design conditions and you can go back here and you say, you know what, I want to design this for 10 degrees outside air and 76% outdoor relative humidity. Hit OK. And then you get an updated correction or an updated D rate. This is going to be what the unit actually produces at that temperature. So it's a really great tool to have. And of course, it also gives you the piping diameter and it'll give you the piping length. Now, since we're on the subject of piping length, if you double left click this, it'll bring up your piping length where you can adjust. So if you Let's just say we're choosing 30 feet, and let's say we have three bends. The number of bends in the system is going to pertain to not a long slope around or a long bend, but it's going to pertain to a 45 degree fitting or a 90 degree fitting, and that's what we consider a bend in the system. So go ahead and hit OK. Now your piping length is updated. And of course, you go through your system. And you can update piping lengths based on whatever the application calls for. Okay, now once you have your piping lengths installed or uh, entered in, excuse me, you're going to go over to the right side of the screen. You're going to see two different tabs. There's units where you can also take drag and drop. But in this case, your performance data. This is where we have our maximum total piping length vertical height allowances and all the different little intricacies in the piping rules for these systems, both from a ductless standpoint and a BRF standpoint, that we can see what we have currently on the system and what are the allowable limits that we cannot exceed. So this is a great tab to look right here just to make sure everything is checking out and see if you need to adjust anything. And then also the most important part on here is going to be your additional refrigerant amount and your total refrigerant amount. So you can see on here, we haven't exceeded the amount for a multi-zone system to start adding additional refrigerant. So essentially all we have here is just the refrigerant charge that's in the outdoor unit is sufficient for this system. Now let's go ahead and click on this window to minimize it. Let's go back here and let's put 70 feet there. Let's put 50 feet there. Go up to the top of your home tab, click on system check, everything checks out, okay. Go back to the right for your performance results. And now, because we've exceeded a certain amount of total piping length between those three zones, we are going to start adding an additional. So we're adding an additional 0.4 pounds, bringing our total refrigerant amount up to 10.6 pounds. Okay, so this is a really great tab to have. As piping lengths change, you can get an accurate readout of what your additional and total refrigerant volume will be. Okay. And again, good rule of thumb is anytime you're about to switch to a new window or add something new to the system, just go ahead and do a quick system check. Make sure it checks out. Great. Looks good. So your two tabs over here. Now with the ductless systems, we don't offer centralized controllers. So we can skip this tab. We can click on the wiring tab. And you'll see on here, because we didn't select any wired remote controllers, nothing's going to populate there. These units come with a wireless control from the factory. The only difference between that and this is it just doesn't pick that wireless control for there, which to be honest with you can be quite confusing, especially if you're sending this to a customer, but do rest assured that the units do come with the wireless remote controller shipped with them. Okay, now if we look at from the outdoor unit to the indoor units, you'll see L1, L2, S, and how they get wired from each individual port at the outdoor unit to 
each individual indoor unit to power it and also provide communication. And this is in the centralized controller view. Okay, centralized controller, design view. Okay, so if you click design view on there, we go ahead and get back to the main design view of the system. Just go ahead and hit a system check. Everything looks good. Okay, now what you're gonna do, and you say, hey, I built this ductless system, but I also have a VRF system on this job. So remember, we're in a Toshiba carrier file, so we can only do a Toshiba carrier VRF system. If you wanna do a carrier two pipe system, you have to open that up in a different file because the carrier two pipe can't be in a Toshiba carrier file and vice versa. Okay, so in this case, we're gonna go ahead and not hover over the ductless system, the first one we have. We're gonna go in this blank white space, right click, hover over, add a new system. And let's just say we've got a heat recovery system. Okay, so that's our Toshiba carrier system that can simultaneously heat and cool. So we go ahead and hover over that and click. And now you have options to choose between 208, 230 and 460 volt. And then you have your options between different tonnages. Now think back when I mentioned and said about the single phase product or the single phase heat recovery is in here. If you look at this first unit right here, you'll see there's two 72,000 BTU units. The difference between them is this number right before the peak. This two signifies a single phase piece of equipment. This nine signifies 208, 230. If you click on the 460 volt tab, you'll see the six before that P indicates 460. The easiest way that I've always thought of it is two is single phase, six means 460, and 208, 230 is nine. Okay, so let's make it simple. We're just going to use a 208, 230, six ton heat recovery outdoor unit. Let's go ahead and click OK. And now we have our second system. Just like we did with the ductless system, we want to go ahead and hover over it. If we want to rename, right click, go over the rename tab, backspace, and then I'm just going to name this VRF1. All right, so we've got our system named, and now what we can do is go up back up to our tabs page. We hit the units, and now you'll see on here we have a header, a Y joint, a single port flow selector and a multi port flow selector. This is where we're going to go in here and determine is this system going to feed directly to a selector box or are we going to take a branching joint which we can drag and drop and hit OK? Or are we going to have multiple selector boxes? And the Y joint is what enables that. So let's just say we're going to have, we'll just use two selector boxes for this circumstance. Let's say we want a single port selector box. So what we can do is hover over it, drag and drop, and it'll ask you for a specific model number on here, and you can go ahead and hit OK. Now, what's easier than doing that is if you right-click this component, you can remove it. And if you go back up here to the Units tab, let's just say we wanted to use a compact four-way cassette, and you go ahead and drag and drop this unit right there. And let's say we needed a one ton cassette. And we're going to call this indoor unit one, test room one, just like we did with the ductless system. If you look over here, you have the height, which is the same thing as the ductless. That's in reference to how the outdoor or where the outdoor unit is located. And that is in terms of vertical height, not actual piping length. And then, of course, the bends and the actual piping length itself, you can adjust here or you can adjust on the main design view screen. So once you have your selections on there, go ahead and hit OK. And it automatically populates the correct selector box, in this case, the single port, with the tonnage of the indoor unit. So there's no guesswork at it. That's what I like to do personally and just let it automatically populate. Now, if you're doing a multi-port flow selector, you can go ahead and go over the box itself, left click, drag and drop. And then from here, you can choose two different types. The number that you're looking for in this case is right before the P, there's a four on there. That is a four port selector. And if you go over to the next one, that's a six port selector. So in this case, we're just gonna use a four port selector. Go ahead and hit okay. And now use our scroll arrow to scroll through the system. So we've got a unit that has a single zone selector and a Y joint that feeds off to a selector box, which has four ports. From here, you can use your units tab to hover over the different type of units. So let's just say we are going to drag and drop a medium static duct, one ton. Let's say we're going to do a high wall unit, 
one ton. Let's say we're going to do an uh, under ceiling floor console. Let's say we're going to do a two ton. And let's just say we're going to do a high wall unit with it as well. We'll do another one ton high wall. Okay, so now you have all your units in the system. You want to hover up right to the outdoor unit and see that 100%. That means this is a six ton system and you have six tons of indoor units connected. It's 100% connected or 100% connected capacity. The rule of thumb with these with VRF systems for both the carrier and the Toshiba carrier product is at minimum, you have to have 50% of the rated capacity connected. So in this case, we have a six ton system. The minimum amount of tonnage that we can have connected to make this work would be three tons, which is half of six. Okay, so scrolling down on here, you wanna go ahead and double left click on this unit. And we just wanna go ahead and name our indoor units and number them. So we'll call this indoor unit two. We'll call this test room. Okay, go ahead and hit enter or you can hit okay. We'll call this indoor unit three. Go ahead and label this test room as well. And we're just going to go down the line and just number everything out. Name the rooms if we want to if we want to name them. If not, you don't have to. It just for me personally, I think it makes it a little bit easier to try to track if you've got a bigger system. Okay, so we have everything labeled on here as far as um, the, the the room that it's going to be serving. In this case, we're just using generic overview, a test room and then numbered our indoor units. Just like with the ductless system too, you can update your piping links depending on how the job is progressing or you can label it as you go. Okay, and it'll adjust everything and update everything. Now, just like the ductless system, if you come over to the performance tab and you left click it, it'll give you your total refrigerant amount and your additional refrigerant amount. Notice how the difference between the ductless and the VRS system for the additional refrigerant amount. This is because the ductless, or excuse me, the VRF systems, as soon as you start piping out of them, you're adding additional refrigerant. So the charge that comes with the outdoor unit is good for zero feet, unlike the ductless system where it's good up until a certain point. These ones you start adding refrigerant as soon as you start piping, which is why it makes it even more critical to track your line set lengths, more importantly, the liquid line, which is what we use for calculating additional charge as the job progresses. What I always tell guys is you're going to get that job report, whether it's an Excel format or a PDF format. And what you're going to get is a printout of this. As things change on the job, all I need from you this, as the service technician, or if you're doing it on behalf of your customer as the salesman, either go into the software and update this or cross it out with a pen and write the correct amount of length and then send it to me and I can get you an accurate additional refrigerant amount and total system refrigerant amount that will need to be written on the outdoor unit in case they need it for future reference. Okay, so we go back up here to the home tab, hit the system check button. Everything looks good, no error codes. Now we can go over to the wiring diagram, just like we had with the ductless. You'll see on here, it'll give you your control bus from your outdoor unit to your indoor units, the gauge of wire that's appropriate, and the name of that bus. So we already know that this was U1 and U2. And we know from the ductless system before that this is going to be your AB bus and also gives you your uh, wire size. Now, the only difference is, is we have a selector box. So it's going to show you each selector box or the box itself, each board inside of here, which has an AB connection, will connect to the unit that it's piped to. So the pipe that flows from the selector box to this unit will also have control wire that follows along from the selector box to that unit almost like a hub and spoke okay but you continue along the line on there and then it'll just show you on here now the only difference is this single port flow selector box is a standalone so it's not going to get wired back to this big one it's just a one-to-one -one on this because this unit's on its own selector not on a port okay if you go to the centralized controller tab you'll see on here a central controller does appear however that does not mean that it's included with the system that's just a generic default. If you want to add this to the system, double left click, and you'll see on here you can choose your type. So we have back end interfaces, touchscreen controllers, iView interfaces, smart manager, centralized controllers, lawn works. Now, in this case, 
touchscreen central controller is typically the most popular option. So go ahead and select that option on there. It'll give you the part number for it and hit add a line. Once you've done that, go ahead and hit the OK button. And now you'll see you'll get your central controller a net relay interface to convert Toshiba Carrier Protocol over into an RS-485 format to display on the centralized controller. Now what you do is double left click on the add system and notice the system VRF1 is on there but not DLS1. That's because the ductless systems can't be tied into the centralized controller for Toshiba Carrier. Only the VRF systems can. So what you can do is select this and hit add or if you have multiple systems Go ahead and hit add all then okay now your system is on a central controller now if you don't want this all you have to do is go over this little tab and it's list menu right click it and delete and it's gone hit a system check everything looks good if you notice up here it says design view let's click that and now we're back at the main design screen okay the last thing that you're going to need to do on there is choose between what you want to do so we'll just run a quick example on here. We're going to go ahead and export this Excel project summary, which we covered before. And notice we have two different systems. So it's giving you a prompt to either choose VRF or a ductless system. So you can either uncheck one, or if you want to output both, you can output both. Your next tab is going to be your outdoor units tab. Now this is where you can choose particular outputs that you might want for a job. So in this case, if you want the cooling efficiency, the EER or the IEER, go ahead and click that. If you want a heating COP rating, go ahead and click that. If you want a correct connected capacity, you want refrigerant pipe or high pressure and low pressure, sound pressure or the decibels of the system, preliminary added field charge, and display elevation. So you can totally choose on what particular items that you want associated or outputs for that outdoor unit. If you go over to your indoor unit, you can choose one of two options, the sound pressure for the fan speed. So you know how loud the fan's gonna be as far as a decibel rating is concerned. And then more importantly, you're leaving air temperature of the supplier of the unit, both in heating and in cool. So you wanna check that, you're more than welcome to check that, or you don't have to check anything at all. It all depends on the job. You have your additional jab, which will include pricing in the equipment summary list and that's master pricing, okay? So now that we have everything selected on here, I always just go right back to the systems, hit okay. And now it's gonna prompt you to either save it on your desktop, you can save it on a USB drive or wherever you feel is the safest place to save it. So we're just gonna save this as test project. And I always label these as job reports. Go ahead and hit save. It'll take a second on there and then you're gonna get a prompt to say, hey, do you wanna open the file? In this case, yes, we wanna open the file. If you don't want to, just hit no and you can go to your desktop to access at any time. And remember, it's an Excel file, so you wanna look for in a little Excel application. So we're gonna open this up and just like we were when we started, here's our Excel report. Here's our cover page, our equipment summary with master pricing, ductless piping, ductless wiring, our VRF system piping, our VRF system wiring, our outdoor unit information such as nominal heating capacities, corrected heating capacities, MCAs and MOCP for breaker and wire sizing, and same thing for the indoor unit. Now in this case, you'll see on here, your estimated coil lead and air temperature, this is the one that we selected personally to want to be able to have. So now you can see coming out of here, what your leaving air temperature and cooling is going to be, and then also the same temperature and heating. So that's gonna be your supply air out of the unit itself. And then finally, you get the same information with your flow selectors, namely being the MCAs for wire sizing for this uh, selector box itself. Okay, Let's just go ahead and back out of here, back out of this, and now we're back in the room selection. And that's a generalized overview and pretty much the basic 101 of how to navigate through the software. Of course, if you guys have any questions on anything, you can always reach out to me directly. Uh, my direct extension at the office is 129, or you can always shoot me an email at tmay at stdair.com. Thank you guys. Hopefully you took something out of this. And again, if you have any questions on this, please feel free to reach out and uh, let me know any questions, comment, 
or concern. Thanks, everyone.